Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Remote No Pressure Podcast. We're so glad that you joined us for another week. This week's interview will not let you down, period. Before we get started, though, before I tell you who's on, I got a couple announcements to make. Number one, I'm going to reiterate, go to the website, remotenopressure.com, and sign up for our mailing list because the first week of May, we're going to make a huge announcement. Now, the first week of May, I've got a date. I'm putting it in stone. First week of May. If you're on the mailing list, you're going to have the news before the first week of May, okay? But the first week of May, the, I think it's May 5th, the first Sunday of May on the podcast, we're going to we're gonna make a big announcement, and we are so pumped. We are so excited about it. But if you're on the mailing list, you're going to know about it first, okay? And the reason why is because there are some, yeah, I can't tell you. I'm not trying to be coy or like, oh, good, you know, I'm being serious. Sign up for the mailing list because it's going to be incredible. Now. That aside, April's turning out to be a great month. Number one, we're planning for this uh, big event, this big announcement, May 5th, which is really cool. I'm going to go with with our producer, John Murphy. We're going to go out fishing next Saturday for some steelhead. Hopefully he can teach me a thing or two because little little do people know, John Murphy is is a killer angler. So I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about that. And then um, April 21st, April 21st of this month. On the corner of Burton and Breton, we're gonna have, we're gonna be here. The RNP crew, the Remote and Press crew, we're gonna be me, John Murphy. We're gonna have Wild Bill, which I don't know if everybody knows Wild Bill or not, but Wild Bill's the one who records my music and stuff. He's an incredible, really cool dude. He's gonna be there as well. You guys can come out and meet the Remote No Pressure podcast crew. You can meet the people who are behind the scenes. I'm going to be performing some new songs, I'll be recording some new songs as well. So if you if you like my album songs about fly fishing. We have more songs coming out. We're going to be recording those live at Orvis, April 21st. So be sure to come out to that. It's going to be cra- It's going to be incredible. They got free beer. They're going to have barbecue. It's going to be a great event. It's you know families are welcome too. It's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun. So be sure to join us this week on the Remote No Pressure podcast. We have legendary NBA Hall of Famer Rick Barry with us. Turns out his agent calls me and says, "Hey." Rick Barry's number one passion, other than basketball, obviously, is fly fishing, and we'd love to we'd love to have him on your show. And I was like, oh, that's great because March Madness, uh, my team, uh, University of Houston, and also my team, University of Michigan, played each other. U of H would have won the game had they shot a few granny shots like Rick Barry, but instead it went down to Michigan, which I don't have a problem with that either because I love both teams. But Rick Barry's here. He's going to tell us all about his basketball life, what he's up to these days. Welcome to the podcast. Let's light the fire. Today on the Remote No Pressure podcast, we have NBA Hall of Famer Rick Barry. Thank you very much for joining us, Rick. Yeah, my pleasure. Now, your your agent's ears must have been ringing because a couple of Saturday nights ago, University of Houston is playing Michigan. And... The, there was a guy on the free throw line, and if he would have made two of those free throws, they would have won the game. And I, I went out to, I was at my brother in law's um, apartment, and we're walking out, and I said, You know what? Have you ever heard of Rick Barry? And he said, No, I haven't. And I said, Rick Barry would have made those free throws. <laughs> you were known for your, your um, un, um, unorthodox free throw shooting what what how did you discover that that was the most efficient way to make a point a free throw well i didn't want to do it back uh, when i was in high school my father who was a semi-pro player and coach um, basically said son i think you can shoot a higher percentage if you try the underhanded method and back then girls shot that way so i said i can't do that because everybody make fun of me and i remember him saying son they can't make fun of you for making them and so Fortunately for me, I guess my father was relentless about getting wanting me to try it. And so I really just did it one summer. And I don't remember it was before my junior or senior year. Um, but I said, okay, let's go. Show me what it is. And I went out just to get him off my back, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> but then then when I uh, when I started doing it, because I gave it a, a sincere effort, because I don't do anything in life half-heartedly, uh, I said, wow, this is actually pretty good. And so I really focused on it, worked on it hard that summer. And that next season, I shot for the first time over 80% and just kept getting better and better. In fact, I made a refinement to my dad's technique late in my career. 
In my last six years, I shot over 92%. In my last two years, I shot over 94%. So it's one of those things where you can actually get better and better at it. And whereas in sports, usually your best age, I remember Jerry West telling me 28 to 32 would be the best years physically. And then you can maintain for a while, obviously, if you stay healthy uh, because of your intelligence and knowledge of the game, which I was able to do. Um, but I got better at my free throw shooting. I was better at the end of my career than I was at the beginning of my career. That's that's phenomenal. Now, let, let me ask you this question. You said you, you don't do anything halfway. I mean, that you do things the right way. Is that what attracted you to, to fly fishing is because it is such an art and it is it does require so much accuracy and thought? And, and is that what draw you to, drew you to fly fishing? Well, uh, what drew me to fly fishing uh, when I was, I had done it many years ago one time, and uh, I was friendly with the gentleman whose son and my son kind of grew up together. And he had been doing it for 30 something years. And so he took me out to go and do it. And so the reason that I liked it is because I'm an active person. I'm an A-type personality. I'm not somebody who will just kind of sit there, hold on to a, a, to a rod and hope that something's going to bite it and just kind of sit there. Uh, when I saw that it really is a skill and it's something that you can learn and perfect and get better and better at. Uh, that was what really drew me to it. The activity of it, the action of it, um, staying busy all the time, you know, learning how to cast various different ways, learning how to mend properly, uh, learning how to make proper presentations. And the better you get at fly fishing as far as your skill level is concerned, there's no coincidence that you're going to catch more fish. And it's all about like, the saying, the tug is the drug. Well, that's me. It's all about feel that strike and set that hook. And it doesn't matter to me what's on the end of it. I could be just as happy and excited about fishing with a three weight rod and catching small little trout as I could be, you know, fishing with a eight or nine weight rod and you know, catching big salmon. So it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't matter to me in that regard. It's all about the number of strikes that I can get and the number of hook sets I can get. What I love about Alaska, where I do my majority of fly fishing, go to some great lodges is the numbers of fish that I can hook into. I, on a regular basis will hook a hundred or more fish a day. And the guides know that I'm up there not to screw around. I didn't come up there to sit down and have a meal cooked, you know, on the shoreline to go ahead and have lunch. I can have lunch anywhere, but I can't hook fish anywhere. So that's what it's all about with me. And they know I'm serious. In fact, one time I went up there and I was up there on my own and, they allowed me to go out with one guide and we flew up to the upper Copper River in the lake there before you float. Usually they have a float coming down. Well, they had a small raft with a motor on it. It was just the two of us. And instead of going and floating down, we went and took the motor and went up into an area where a lot of people don't go. And the guide knew that he said, you know, Rick, we got to get 100 today. I said, well, if it's just you and me and nobody else is with us and we have a, this motor on this little raft, I said, if we don't get 100, I said, I'm not going to be a happy guy. <laughs> and so we got a hundred. So we got a hundred so fast. He said to me, he said, Rick, I think we get 200 today. I said, let's go for it. So it was so much fun. I worked my butt off. He worked his butt off. Boy, like, give me that. Bring that in, Rick. Let's change that. Change that up. Do it. Oh, okay. That's enough. Let's go. We're going to move. And so we hooked, uh, I hooked uh, with his, his help and he was awesome. And uh, with 224 fish in one day. And the only reason I stopped there was because it was 24, my number, and we had to get back to get picked up and taken back to the lodge. So it was just an amazing day. Would you say that's your most memorable day fishing? Actually, that that was probably my most fun day fishing because of the action that I had, uh, the number of, of fish that we were able to hook. And the beauty of Alaska is you fish with barbless hooks. And so I've actually learned if it wasn't something picture worthy, something really big or cool that I didn't have a photo of, I, you can learn to get them off quick so that I get it back out there and get another strike. But my most memorable day in, in fly fishing was that when I went out actually was the owner, Chad Dewitt, who was the owner of Rainbow River Lodge, one of the owners. And he's a pilot as well, but he happened to go out with us that day. And so we were walking on a small, on a, on a little small stream and, you know, and having a nice day, you know, taking fish and just get around lunchtime. And the river wasn't real high that particular year. And so they got on the gravel bar and they said, okay, well, let's, let's stop. We'll have some lunch here. And so they stopped to have lunch. And of course, knowing me, I'm not going to stop and not fish. There's just water around. 
And so the stream was coming down in front of us and coming in. It might have been maybe 15, 18 feet wide at, at the most. And it came straight down and then it made a big bend off to the left. So I went over there and I started fishing. So I go to the next fishing and I hook a fish. And so I keep hooking, I keep fishing and I hook another fish. And I cast and I hook another fish. Well, to make a long story short, I hooked a trout on 24 consecutive casts. And they were all going, this is insane. None of, nobody could believe it, that, that what they were witnessing. Because sometimes when you go, you might get lucky to a little pocket and you'll get four or five, six fish out of it. Right. But 24 consecutive casts, I hooked a trout. And, and of course, my number when I played ball was 24. I, so it was just, it was almost divine intervention or something there. But that was the most incredible experience in fly fishing. I have other stories and things I've remembered a lot. But I mean, that is something that I doubt I'll ever, ever duplicate. How did you get into fly fishing? My friend who grew up with my friend whose son and mine grew up together. I actually met him because I was actually babysitting was for my son when my wife was working for USA Basketball. And I was, I was in a babysitting co-op because I was home and I was the only male doing it. And it was a, it was a very funny story. I'm like, I'm like Scott Minnick, so I'm, I'm babysitting Jeffrey, who was, I think, three at the time. He was a year older than my son, who was maybe three and a half. My son was two and a half. And he told me, he said, I, he said, I come home from work one day and, and my wife says to me, she says, did you ever hear, hear of this guy, Rick Barry? And he goes, yeah. And she said, he said, why? He says, well, he was babysitting Jeff today. He says, come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, come on. No. Yeah, you're telling me that Rick Barry was babysitting Jeff. She said, yeah. So he didn't believe her. So the next day I'm babysitting again. He gets done. He comes over after he comes over to pick up Jeff and he says, I'll be damned! It is you, <laughs> and so, so, so that's that's how Scott and I met, and um, and so then he was the one that said, "Hey, have you ever fly fish?" I said, "Well, one time doing it." You know, I said, "Hey, I, I've been fly fishing for thirty plus years. You want to go with me sometime?" So I said, "Well, oh, okay." So I went out with him and did it, and really, that's he's the guy that kind of got me into it. He taught me a lot, and uh, then I've learned so much from the guides. The guides are awesome. Uh, I always tell him, I said, here's the situation. I said, I love doing this. Don't ever feel bad about correcting me. I, said, I want to know if you see something I'm doing incorrectly, please tell me. If you have some pointers for me, please help me out. And I'm all about fishing with guys. I'm too old to want to learn how to tie flies. I'm horrible at that little fine motor skill stuff. I, I'm a hell of an athlete, but I don't tie flies. <laughs> and I don't do that little stuff. And I don't want to do it. I don't want to have to learn, you know, do I want to use a caddis? Do I want to use, you know, a, a woolly bugger? Do I, I, I want to go with a guide who knows what he's doing, who's going to take me to where the fish are, who's going to put what I need to have on the end of the line and then point me in the right direction and let me go and cast and start hooking fish. That's what I want to do at this stage of my life. Unfortunately, in Alaska, at Rainbow River Lodge with Chad or with Bill Betts down at the Leander River Lodge or... Some of the other people who uh, who I know, Roger Glasby, he has Rainbow King Lodge. Uh, it's it's just an amazing experience, and uh, yeah, uh, it's it's something I really look forward to doing. I go two, three, four times sometimes in the summertime uh, up to Alaska. I've had some nice fishing, gone out with some great people, done some stuff in a number of lodges, Boardwalk Lodge, another place uh, that I've gone to with, uh, with with Brad, who's one of the owners there. A uh, great place, you know, you can get the salt water if you want to catch fish to bring home to eat and catch the ling cod and get the halibut. And it's not super deep water and it's not rough water. Um, but, you know, but I prefer the fly fishing. I, that's what I really do prefer because I just think it's uh, it's just special. Uh, catching a fish on a fly rod for people. I have a way that I explain it, but I won't do this on the podcast to explain it. But um, because it's, I'm, I'm going to edit myself. But <laughs> It's a wonderful experience, and there is a major difference between catching a fish on a fly rod as opposed to a bait casting, using bait casting or using a spinning rod. Now, there's a lot of people that are attracted to fly fishing that have a type A, really um, high drive personality. I mean, we see a lot of investment bankers, a lot of people in really high stress jobs who are like you, Rick, who are very driven. Is it is it something about fly fishing that helps you? I mean, obviously you don't you're not there. You're a numbers guy, 
you're not there to just calm down, but does it bring a sense of peace to you uh, when you're out on the water or are you just, it's the thrill of the chase for you? Uh, it's both actually. I mean, it's still, it's the challenge of trying to catch them <clears throat> and um, you know, making the right cast and being in the right place. And, uh, but it's also very, it's also relaxing for me. I mean, it's exhilarating. The adrenaline rush every time I get a strike, you know, feel a strike and set that hook is awesome. And I love that. I live for that. Uh, it's been an integral part of my life uh, for so many years, playing basketball and being involved in sports. And so I love that aspect of it. But it also, at times, it's, it's, it's incredibly peaceful. I mean, a lot of times we've gone out and I go fish and it's just the, the guide and me or the guide and my buddy uh, and maybe another another guide and some other friends that have gone out together and sometimes we don't see anybody else other than the animals and that's that's pretty special i'm not in for the combat fishing thing you find some places uh or, you know i one time i went to go for king sam and thank goodness i wasn't paying for it but i just was on a trip doing something with randy jones the former baseball pitcher and the Padres who had this, this TV show called the strike zone. And I got to do shows with him that we went up to do a few shows. Went to, actually, I, I got him to go to boardwalk lodge and we had a great time there. And then we also, uh, went down and, and did some silver salmon fishing, uh, on the, uh, little Sioux river, uh, up in Wasilla. And he wanted to see a buddy. His buddy said, but yeah, we can take you out. We'll go on the Kenai and go, you know, some king fishing. And it was a miserable rainy day. And, so, but we go out to do it, and I didn't realize you go you go in the boat to float backwards, and you're drifting, and you're, and then a boat pulls up ten feet next to us, and I start looking around. Even on this miserable, ugly, rainy day, I counted as far as down to one end of the part of the river to the other bend of the river, I counted sixty boats. Wow, that's not my that's not my <laughs> idea of Alaska fishing and fun fishing when I can go sometimes and not see anybody. Right. And on some of the rivers you go and you don't see very many people at all. And you really are out in the last frontier. I mean, it really truly is the world is. I mean, these lodges are like 300 miles from civilization. And yet what they've done and they put in these beautiful cabins and you've got hot water and showers and you've got beautiful you know, food and a place to stay. It's really a very special experience, something that I enjoy tremendously. And actually, to be honest with you, I think in life you have to have goals. And so my goal in life now is to go fly fishing in Alaska up at one of the lodges that I've been going to for a number of years when I'm a hundred years old. Is that, do you think that that's what's driving you? I mean, like I've heard a lot of people say similar things about setting, you know, goals, especially with our, our age. Um, is that, is there, is that playing a number on your health? Do you think? That that's keeping you healthier by having well, that long term yeah. goal? Well, I mean, I, I always, well, I try to stay healthy. I mean, I, I try to do that. I try to watch my health and do a lot of things to, I'm a preventative kind of guy. I don't, you know, the crazy thing is people wait until something's bothering them before they go. You go in and you get checked up. You go and find out if there's anything wrong that you can get corrected before it gets to be a major problem. So I do yearly checkups if anything at all is bothering me or I think there's a concern. I'm in there to try to find out what it is to make sure it's not anything of any serious nature and and make sure that it gets taken care of. And so I've always been that way. And as a result, hopefully God is going to allow me to be around and be healthy and be physical enough and physical enough shape to be able to go up and go to Alaska and go fly fishing. I'm not going to be able to do it the way that I've done it for so many years where, you know, I'm out there and I'm, I'm killing myself walking in the middle of the river and going up and down through all of the salmon, you know, the salmon nests that are there and doing all the crazy things that I've done over the last 10 years or more. Uh, you know, I don't expect to be in that kind of condition, but I mean, I'm talking about being physical enough to be able to get up there and walk around, get into a boat, be able to get out and stand and wait a little bit and just be able to be healthy and physical enough to be able to enjoy fly fishing in Alaska. Now you have three boys, am I right? I have five boys. Five boys. Do they all play in the NBA or three of them do? Or I had, I had three played, I've already, three have already played the NBA. The other one was the last cut by the Boston Celtics. And if they had 15 man rosters like they have now, we would have made the team because my son Scooter was on the championship team in Kansas with Andy Manning. Uh, Bird and Mikhail both told me that Kirk was some should have made our team. He said he was better than our number one pick. Unfortunately, it was back when they had 12 men rosters. 
and only uh, and they had 13 low cut contracts and there wasn't any room for him. So my son played professionally, he played in the minor leagues, and also he played overseas and he played until he was 40 years old. In fact, he still plays today. He's 15, 51 coming up. He still plays on a national championship. They've won some national championships for the Olympic Club in San Francisco, and he still can play. He still can dunk at his age. Uh, and so he did that. And then my youngest son, Canyon, who just finished, I think is good enough to play in the NBA. Unfortunately, he hasn't given that opportunity and hopefully that will come about. So he's playing after his last year at Florida last year, where he was the sixth man of the year in the SEC and uh, was the academic all America player of the year. A uh, brilliant young man who was five credits away, maybe five credits away from getting his master's in nuclear engineering. He's playing overseas. He's averaging, on a team where he, you know, they don't, it's not like the coach over there doesn't try to feature the American player. So he takes only like 12 shots a game, but he's averaging 18, shooting over 50% from twos, over 40% from threes, around his 80% free throws, his free throws, getting about six rebounds a game and just playing really well. Um, you have a birthday coming up, am I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have, you know, I'm 74 years old, which is hard for me to believe. I remember when I was a kid. They met somebody and they said they were 50. He said, oh, my God, they're so old. They're 50. You know? And so, I mean, it's, it's only a number. And uh, you know, to be honest, thank God I'm blessed in that regard. I've been incredibly healthy. I thank God every night. I don't really feel any differently than I felt in my late 40s. I just can't run as fast or jump as high. And, you know, unfortunately, I had a really bad bicycle accident three years ago. And, and so I was in the wheelchair for three months and, and – uh, and broke my pelvis in five places. Thank God I had an incredible surgeon, Dr. Patel. I thank God for him every night as well. He put me back together. I actually joked with him and said, who said that you can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again? <laughs> and and I don't even know that you know that's the case. I So I basically can do all the things I could do before, but I'm just very cautious now, so I don't do as much even when I have to go and walk and get a place where it's a little bit yeah, touchy as far as the terrain is concerned. I'll get the guy to come, you know, use his arms for support to make sure that I don't fall because I can't take a chance of taking a bad fall because of all the pins and screws and rods I have in me. Mm-hmm. And so I'm very much more cautious about what I do, but I, I still can do everything I could have done before. So, uh, yeah. And, you know, I, I have to say one other thing about the prison kept talking about the strikes, you know, the tug is the drug and all of the wonderful things there. But to be honest with you, even if I didn't catch a lot of fish, sometimes things happen that just the one thing that happened, makes for the day and also the beauty that what you see when you're out there it's so spectacular you can't help but have an enjoyable time it's just a matter of how great the enjoyment is and for me obviously if i'm hooking more fish i enjoy it more but it's not like i go out there and have a miserable time if i'm not getting fish especially if i'm in a beautiful environment and i get to see some of the animals you know i've had bears walk 10 feet past me uh, i've taken some amazing photos and seen bears you know, fishing and it's it's almost a surreal environment up there, and that's why I love it so much. And it's not like it has to be fly fishing, but I prefer that. I just got back from fishing with a a friend of mine with mm. uh, that I was with, a great bachelor who I actually met on a safari with my wife and son in South Africa. He was there with his wife, and so we fished up in Montana once, and now we just fished down in El Salto and Pacheco, the two lakes down there in Mexico outside of. Uh, uh, trying to think, I remember where the heck we flew into. Anyway, it was it, it was down in Mexico, El Salto, which has the biggest, they say, the biggest bass in the world. And this, and I caught the biggest bass I ever caught. I didn't catch a monster one, but it was almost six pounds. But some other wow. people were catching seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve pound bass. And so that was I was doing not bait casting, was doing spinning there. But I could still enjoy that as well. And I can enjoy sometimes doing some bottom fishing if I want to catch some fish to bring home to eat, as long as I'm not in really super rough water. But it's not, it's just not as much fun for me as the fly fishing. Right. Right. I, I hear you. Yeah. It's, it's more than just the fishing. There's the environment, um, being aware of what's around you. It, it's a drug. It really is. Um, I yeah, to- I try to tell people you got to try it. I mean, really, it, it's just it, it's great. And, and the beauty of the fly fishing again is that it is a skill that can be learned and can be perfected. And the better you get, the more fish you will hook. That's the difference. I can I can throw a spinning rod and get it out to the area, but then when you're doing it and you're bringing it in with a technique, I mean, it, it, you just got to kind of get lucky. It's not as if 
You have to go and make great presentations to throw where you see the fish are, mend the property, get it there. You just don't, I don't know what's there. I'm testing out there. I'm hoping something down below maybe decides where to bite it. I mean, so <laughs> it whereas when you're, when you're going, when you're flying fishing, especially on fly fishing, you get the chance to do a lot of sight fishing. Right. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, ca- I'm, ca- I'm casting beads in three feet of water and I can see, I can see the fish I'm going after sitting in behind the side guys a lot of times. And I can watch the bead and make sure I kind of cast it and get it to go with it. I mean, my gosh, that's, uh, well, that's amazing. That and watching them go after it and hit it. You're setting the hook while you're watching it. You know, that and, and watching it come up on with clear water coming up and hit the dry fly on the surface. Wow. That's it's very special. It's very, very amazing. Um, the question I have for you, Rick, up until this point, because obviously, um, you know, you're, you've got a lot of goals still ahead of you. But what would you say in life, in life as a whole, in your family, your career and everything, what would you say has been your greatest, what has been your greatest achievement that you're most proud of, Rick? The thing I'm most proud of is that none of my children have done anything foolish in their life to ruin their lives. I think as a parent and you have kids, you're always praying and hoping that your kids have a good life and turn out to be good people. That's more important than anything else. I mean, as much as I love the fly fishing and everything, I'm just, I'm, I'm so happy that they've done that. And I'm so happy that my boys have had an opportunity to experience what allowed me to provide them with a great life, the game of basketball, that that's been an integral part of their life as well. And even now a whole bunch of them have actually gotten into that broadcasting work, which I did for years. So to be able to see your sons enjoying life in the same professions that I have, have been involved in and to be good people, that is more important than, you know, than anything else. And, and the fact that, you know, God has blessed them also with you know, having good health because without good health, with all the money in the world doesn't mean anything. Uh, you know, I didn't make crazy amounts of money. They, if I got three zeros in my contract. Never heard the word million dollars, but I would do it all over again. I mean, because it's it's just such an incredible, it's an incredible experience to be a part of a team that has success and to be a part of a sport that is that brings you together. It's like being having another family. Like the championship year that we had seventy five with the Warriors, we were like another family, and all of those, all the members of that team were all very special to me and were a very special part of my life. What do you think? Or do you think there was, um, there is a key to success on, I mean, there's a lot of listeners to the podcast that have children that are there, maybe they're in the throes of raising children and they, like you, would like their children to grow up and be contributors to society, to be able to find themselves and be, be good people and kind people. What, what do you think it was? you think it was your parenting style? Or is there any advice you can give some people who maybe fly fish, but also are raising children as well? Yeah, well, certainly. I mean, you have to instill good values in them um, and, and, and teach them that, you know, like my dad, one of the greatest things ever is that you always have to give your best effort to everything you do in life. Don't ever settle for you know, doing something without giving your best effort. Uh, because then you can just go to sleep at night and feel good about the fact that you tried your best that day. And if you fail, it's okay. Learn from the mistakes you might have made. And just make yourself a better person the next day. So you try to instill those values in, in your kids. And when it comes to what you do for them, you have such a profound impact on them because they're a product of your environment. So the things that you expose them to and the things that you try to instill in them as far as those values are so critical. You have to be very careful as to what you're doing. And one of the worst things you can do when it comes to today's world is to try to force them to go and do something that you wish you had done and to make them play sports that maybe you wanted them to, you want them to play as opposed to letting them make the decision. So what I tell people to do is see what they do, see if they have an affinity for something, if they're drawn to art, if they're drawn to music or whatever it may be, support them in it and expose them to as much as possible. Make them play more. Don't make them play just one sport. Let them play other sports when they're growing up. Let them see what they like. Let them see what they seem to do better than the others and let them make the choice and then support them as much as you possibly can in what it is that they want to do, not what you want them to do. Well, and uh, all your boys 
wanted to do broadcasting and basketball. So maybe it's genetic. Well, they all know the broadcasting. <laughs> the broadcasting came later. The broadcasting came later. The basketball they wanted to do, and I actually, to be honest with you, almost almost discouraged them. I didn't. Dis- I'd say not to do it, but I did say to them that it, just remember that if you're going to decide to do this, I will do everything I can to teach you as much as I know to give you a chance to be as good as you might be, but then you have to put the effort forth. But just remember that if you're going to do that, it's going to be very difficult for you because you are always going to be compared to me. There's going to be a giant shadow cast upon you your entire life as long as you play basketball. And so they said, fine, no problem. I remember my son, John, saying, well, I don't care, Dad. I'm going to be better than you were anyway. And I said, son, I hope you're right. And so... You know, that, that's something, in fact, again, you could have such an impact. I, I honestly tried to discourage them from playing football because I always felt that they were, like me, very slight, weren't big, strong, physical kids, very late developers physically, and I didn't think football was a sport that would be conducive for them, that they might have a chance to get injured or something because they weren't that, you know, that big and physical. And I tried to discourage it. And all of my older boys, my first four boys, all played at least one season of football. And then they made the decision they wanted to do it. And I was thrilled when they said no. <laughs> and uh, made the decision to do what they wanted to do. And the only one I had success out of getting him not to play football at all was my youngest son, Ken. And he never did play football. He played other sports. He was an all he was ball state and tennis and doubles. He won the state in Colorado badminton. He was a badminton champion in high school. He was, as I say, he played doubles and tennis and was state champion a couple of years after just playing for a few years in, uh, in, in doubles. And uh, yeah, so uh, that's what you do. You support them, but let them find what it is that they like. 1980, you retired, correct? Was it 1980? Yes. And you were down in Houston. Not because I. Not because I. Let me just interrupt. And say, <laughs> not because I wanted to. Okay. I didn't. I didn't want to. Re, I didn't want to retire. I actually had my knee scoped at the end of the year because I had gotten knocked down and I had some stuff. And I, the doctor found, he found a uh, huge piece of calcium wedged in the back of my knee joint. In fact, he said to me, Rick, how in the world did you ever play with this in there? I said, well, because I never knew it was in there. <laughs> and he removed that. And for the first time in 10 years or more, I actually didn't have pain. Uh, I could sleep through the night. I could sit in a movie theater or on an airplane and, and not have to get, try to stretch my leg out and have all this pain. And so it was like having a new leg. And then the NBA, that season, to show you how different things are now back as to where they are back then, In 1980, the NBA cut the rosters from 12 men to 11 men to save money. I had the Boston Celtics interested in me. I would have probably gone to play with the Celtics. I had the Celtics, the Lakers, and the Sonics, all three of the better, best teams in the league, interested in having me come play from the Celtics were known for bringing in some of the older players to do that. And I was prepared to go there and play with the Celtics and come off the bench, play back up the bird, be a part of that to have a chance to get another championship team. And it never happened because I mean my I, my knee hadn't felt so good. In fact, that summer I had some current players come up to the mm-hmm. camp that I had in Northern California, and we would scrimmage at lunchtime and do it. And I was killing them. I I, I just was playing so well and feeling so good, and never played again. Well, thank you very much, Rick, for uh, spending some time with us. Do you have a website, or if someone wanted to see what you were up to these days, how would they do that, Rick? Well. I'm going to, um, yeah, well, I, a lot of times I, I haven't had anything up there to put some of the trips together, but, you know, uh, rickberry24.com is one that I'll sometimes put stuff up there and some of the trips that I put together if people want to try to join me. And I have some things there, but I haven't really done a lot with it right now, but I'll probably do a little bit more. All right. Well, thank you very much, Rick. We really appreciate you spending some time with us. My pleasure. Well, thank you, Rick, and thank you for joining us another week on the Remote No Pressure Podcast. We're just so grateful every week. Um, the, the messages that I get, the people whose lives have been impacted by, by picking up fly fishing through the, epi- through the podcast. We truly believe that fly fishing has the power to change the world, and it's just cool to see the impact that we're having. Also, like I said at the beginning of the podcast, because I love you, and I'm very grateful for you, and I'm so happy, and I want to share things with you, go to the website at remotenopressure.com and sign up for the mailing list because you're going to be the first one. Now, we're going we're gonna to be um, doing this the first Sunday of May, but if you're on the mailing list, you're going to know what it's about before then. 
and I love you and I'm thankful and grateful for you and I want you to be a part of it first and you'll understand why whenever you get the email, okay? So go to remoteunderpressure.com, sign up for our mailing list. Also, join us this uh, this month, April 21st at Orvis in Grand Rapids on the corner of Burton and Breton in Breton Village Mall, Orvis Fly Shop. We're going to be recording some new music there. We're going to have the RNP crew out. We're going to have a blast. It'll be a great time. There's going to be some awesome drinks there. We're also going to have barbecue. Uh, Orvis is putting that on. And big shout out to Trent, anyone who goes to Orvis there in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, there on Burton and Breton. Yeah, um, holler out to, to Trent because he asked us, invited us to come. And we are so grateful for the opportunity. So let's just show up and have a great time. And until next time, go fishing. <laughs>